when you're doing hair on set, it's different than salon hair because it's in the salon world, you spend more time kind of shampooing and blowing out and color. We don't have that kind of time or resources when you're on set. So it's really about people coming in, not camera ready, but their hair is ready to be styled in whatever style is deemed appropriate for that scene. So you don't really, you don't need shampoos, you don't need conditioners or a lot of wet, wet set products like, you know, mousses, although you can have some mousses, but generally it, you've got about 20 minutes or so to turn everybody around and make them look like they need to look. So, um, so more focus on more styling tools, combs, brushes, your scissors, your clippers, your cape. Uh, your power cords, your pa your extension power cords. This is something really important that most people don't think about. Welcome to the Hair Artist Academy podcast, where it's all about helping you build a successful business and life filled with purpose, passion, and prosperity. And now, your host, Brenda Waters, a.k.a. Ms. H2O. Hello and welcome to the Hair Artist Academy podcast. I am your host, Brenda Waters. Many of you know me as Ms. H2O. Our featured guest today is Anne Michelle Radcliffe. Anne Michelle is an Emmy Award winning hairstylist with over 25 years of experience in the entertainment industry. She is also the recipient of the 2011 Designing Women Award for her ensemble work on Showtime's Nurse Jackie and her contribution to television and the film industry. She has worked with some of Hollywood's favorite celebrities such as Elle McPherson, LeBron James, Julianne Moore, and Matt Damon. Welcome back to the show, Anne Michelle. Thanks, Brenda. It's great to be back. I'm so happy to be here. Well, as you guys know, and some of you may not know, uh, Anne Michelle came on a week ago and the information that she provided the HAA audience was just so astounding. It was so insightful. And we decided to do something we've never done in the history of the HAA podcast is a part two. So this is part two of our first part series uh, for Anne Michelle and those of you who are interested in working in television and film. And we're so ecstatic to have her back on the show. Let's start with uh, the day in the life of. Could you tell us what the day in the life of a hair and makeup artist working in television and film entails? It's, you know, starting from that first phone call, booking that project to, you know, showing up for work, who you report to, all those things that, you know, most of us have no clue about. Sure. Uh, well, there are a couple different um, aspects to this question, but I will address the aspect of being a temporary hire, uh, but we in the industry we call it an additional, um, additional hair and makeup, um, depending on what department you work in. Uh, so I'll focus on that as opposed to being in a full time position within, you know, a production. So as an additional or a daily hire, which is basically how you would get started in television and film industry, because there's so much to know behind the scenes. There's no way that you can start with no experience, and then land a full-time department head or department key job. Plus, you need to know people and be in the infrastructure in that inside loop to, to also get those jobs. So when the call comes in, and usually it's not a call, it usually is a text. So it's really important that you have smartphones these days because if you're in the industry, um, when you're on set, you're not allowed to make a lot of noise, and there are many, many times where you can't talk. So that is our mode of communication, is silent communication, which is texting. So you'll get a text, and it will say something like, are you available, and then the date. Um, and then you would respond, and let's say you say, I'm available, and you show up. They'll give you the call time, and the call time is the time that you need to be there when you actually are getting ready to set up. Then from that time, you've got 18 minutes in which you can set up your stuff at your station, and then you're prepared to work. And for additional hair people or daily hires, you will be working on background people. Generally, it's a bunch of background people for big, um, 
big scenes that have a lot of uh, bu busy things happening in the background, but they still need to go through hair and makeup. Even though you don't really see them as a focal point, every single one of them have to go through hair, makeup, and wardrobe, which nobody realizes. So it's very interesting, and there's a lot of background work or daily hire work in the industry. So it's a great way to start, and there's a lot of work there. So don't feel like um, that there's not enough work there because that's how you get started, and there's so much of it. So you get the call, you get your call time, you get the location, and you got to make sure your, your kit is packed because you are responsible for bringing all of your tools to work, to set with you. And generally, everybody packs it in a, a little rolly cart, and you need blow dryers, you need combs and brushes, multiple combs and brushes, because you have you may have a lot of different background people, and it's unsanitary to use the same comb on everybody. And uh, not to be gross, but sometimes the daily hires, actors or whomever, they don't come in quite clean, and you just need to make sure that you're practicing proper sanitary procedures. So you have your text and you're excited about showing up, you get there for your call time, which is the time you're supposed to arrive on location, uh, you get everything set up, and then what happens from there? Well, then generally, um, the key hair department person, which is the assistant to you know the department head, will come and give you guidance about and direction of how you need to make your background look. So you could be doing a period piece, 1950s period piece. You could be doing contemporary. You could be doing, you know, um, background in a hospital and they need to look, you know, kind of messy or businesslike. So whatever the scene is calling for, you'll get direction from one of the full-time people there to tell you exactly what to focus on. And then, so your background will funnel through and you will take care of all the people that come to your chair. And th there's actually a production assistant that helps that process. And then once everybody is done, they call everybody to set. And that means um, you pack up your kit, you have, you have your working kit that you're doing everybody's hair from. And then you need to take a, another kit called a set kit. And within that set kit, it's smaller, it's portable, you usually wear it on your body, usually kind of a cross body strap kind of thing, a uh, bag container type of thing, and then you take all the things that you're going to need to touch up people before they shoot, like extra pins, um, combs, hairspray, you know, uh, pomades, whatever you need, you think you'll need to maintain those hairstyles that you've created. Now, once you get to set, oh, and a set chair, you also need to bring a set chair. So we're responsible as makeup artists and hairstylists for bringing our own stuff, our set bag, and our own chairs, which need to be portable, like those mini folding camping chairs. Those work great. Um, but whatever it is, it needs to be really portable and lightweight because you're responsible for schlepping it around. So you go to set with all of your set, set equipment. And then um, as all the actors file in and all the background people are placed and the scene is being rehearsed, you just kind of be quiet, stay to the side. Generally, hair and makeup people kind of sit together, uh, not in the way. And the first AD will call uh, last looks, if you've never heard of that term before, which is a very television and film kind of industry-specific term. Last looks means... Everybody, hair, makeup, wardrobe that needs to go in and look everybody over one last time before we actually shoot something. So when you hear last looks, it's like this rush of hair, makeup, and wardrobe people going in to touch up their actors or the people they're responsible for to make sure that they are, they look exactly like they're supposed to look. If they're supposed to look messy, you make sure they look messy. If they're supposed to look pristine, you know, you just make sure you've got one last look before cameras roll to make them look exactly how they look. So those are called touch-ups. Last looks, touch-ups. So we have our main kit and then we have a set kit which goes to set with us as well as a set chair. So this is all of our set equipment. Is that correct? That's correct. Awesome. So let's talk about attire. What should you wear when you're working on uh, television and film? Well, obviously, um, common sense dictates what you choose. You need to be comfortable. 
you need to have some decorum about your dress. Um, obviously, for gals, you don't want really plunging necklines. Um, you want to wear darker colors. You want to wear types of fabric that don't call attention to yourself or pull focus from behind the camera, like sequins or bright colors. Or um, you want to wear more muted colors, browns, blacks, grays, because, you know, it's not about you being the star. It's about you fading into the background behind the camera, being comfortable, being warm and or, you know, or cool, but still having the right amount of decorum and modesty when you're on set because you're with a lot of other people, sometimes up to 200 people. You know, you've got grips and gaffs and all kinds. So it's really important as a professional that you dress as a professional. And in terms of footwear, whatever is most comfortable because you're standing on your feet for the better part of up 16 to 18 hours a day. So it's really important that you are comfortable. Oh my God, 16 to 18 hours a day? That's a very kind of standard work day if you're doing um, production work, especially episodic television. It's a brutal work schedule, and that's every day, five days a week, sometimes six days a week. That's every day. Unbelievable. That's a normal work day for hair and makeup. So you're getting very little sleep. Yes, you're getting very little sleep. There is something in our union contract that's called uh, a turnaround time, um, which is a minimum amount of time that makeup and hair people have from the time they leave set at night to the time that they have to be back at their call time the next morning. And that number of hours is called your turnaround. And the minute there is a minimum of amount, and that's nine hours. So in those nine hours for your turnaround, you have to get home, take care of yourself, try and get some sleep, get up, get yourself back to work in nine hours. Whoa. Sometimes it's more, but generally if it's a nine-hour turnaround and you're doing episodic television, which is perhaps the most grueling of all the you know, the, the practices, they usually bump up right against your nine hour, nine to 10 hour turnaround every single day. So needless to say, you're exhausted. You you have perma exhaustion because it's, it's a type of tired that you can't really recover from, you know, in a few hours of sleep. Again, another reason why to wear very comfortable, well fitting clothes and comfortable shoes. So, um, it's also a good idea to take layers because sometimes you're shooting interiors um, and sometimes those interiors are exceptionally chilly or exceptionally warm. Um, so you need to have your layers with you in a bag or in the camper or somewhere just in case you need to put them on or, you know, de-layer yourself if, you know, you're shooting in a tiny apartment and it's super hot. Or if you're getting ready to move into exteriors, you can start doing interiors at the first half of the day and then move into exteriors. Let's say they needed to shoot a nighttime exterior and you're out on set outside until four in the morning, which is very, very, very common in all kinds of weather. It doesn't matter if it's raining. It doesn't matter if it's snowing. It doesn't matter if it's five degrees outside. You are still responsible for dressing yourself appropriately for the weather and being on set and professional and ready to do your job at all times in all weather conditions. Oh my God. Well, let's just talk about one thing <laughs> that a hair, a lot of busy hair and makeup artists may or may not get to sometimes during their day. And if they do, it's just bit by bit. Lunch. When do you eat? <laughs> That's exactly how we all feel as soon as we go in is when do we get to eat? <laughs> because... <laughs> You know, you're hungry, you're tired, and the food really helps give you the energy to get through your very long day. So generally, when you come in to, to work in the morning, they will provide a hot breakfast for you. Um, generally, that's union rules. So, you know, you'll set up and you'll go get your breakfast. And then union rules says that six hours after crew call time, not hair and makeup artist call time because we're always pre-called. We're generally called pre-called an hour and a half 
before regular crew call because it's our job to get everybody ready so that when the crew comes in and sets up, we're ready to shoot, that nobody's waiting on hair and makeup so, you know, to hold up the production. So anyway, so six hours after the crew call is when lunch is supposed to happen, and that's a union rule. But most of the time, lunch is pushed, and that's called going into penalty. So let's say they're in the middle of trying to get the scene shot, and it's six hours, and it's technically lunchtime, but you don't get broken for lunch because the director decides that he wants to finish shooting this scene out before he breaks everybody for lunch. So instead of six hours after breakfast for hair and makeup, you could go eight to ten hours before you get to eat again. But lunch is officially called, eventually, and it's usually... A half an hour lunch if catering is provided, and that includes hot food. Or there's another type of lunch called a walk away. And that is they break everybody for lunch and you have an hour in which to walk away and buy your own lunch somewhere and eat it and get back to set. And that's called a walk away lunch. You mentioned temp, those who are, are, are temporarily working on a project, and there are people who are full-time. The temp people don't necessarily get to work with uh, the main uh, actors and actresses on uh, the project. Now, those people who are full-time, who actually get to work hand-in-hand uh, hand with uh, some of the big, big-time celebrities, if you will, uh, what is etiquette like for, for those people? What what are the requirements and professionalism that they should have when working with celebrities? Yes, of course, there's proper etiquette. As you can imagine, working so closely with somebody that, you know, a very close relationship um, is formed. Um, but when you're working with the celebrities or the stars of the movie or the TV show, um, you get to know very quickly what their kind of idiosyncrasies are, you know, if they, if in the morning when they're getting ready, they like to be quiet and focus on the lines that they need to prepare for, for shooting, or if they're the type of individual that likes to come in and release stress by talking. Um, and, and that's just by spending time with that person and, uh, you know, and, and they, being a people profession, because we are touching and working with people all the time, you just pick up on it. And uh, and then you just kind of respect their space. You don't over talk to them. You don't get in their business. You don't say, you know, you don't try to be besties with them, because that's definitely crossing over the professional line. There's a level of professional decorum that you, as an artist, a hair or makeup artist, need to honor and uh, not get into their personal business. And that also <laughs> can go for just day to day working in the salon. You know, if someone invites you in, then that's one thing. But don't invite yourself, right? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit more about your kit as a as a hair and makeup person. Now, what are some things that, a, let's specifically uh, focus on hairstylists. What are some things that one needs to have in their kit to be prepared for a particular project? Well, there's so many things that as a, as a hair artist that you are going to need, whether it's in your kit for that day, that particular job or not, um, will be up to your contact on the project uh, because you're going to ask them, what do I need to bring in my kit? What kind of kit do I need to bring? But the many things that you're going to need in your hair kit arsenal is, as you can imagine, several, several hot roller kits. You need all kinds of irons, all sizes, flat irons, curling irons, all diameters. You need all kinds of pomades and sprays and kind of mousses. Now, is that when you get to the setup for the background area, it's generally in a church, the bottom of a church or the bottom of a school or something because they need a, an environment where they can hold a lot of people. Then production will come in and set up these long tables with, you know, kind of uh, wardrobe mirrors and clip on lights. So power for your blow dryer and your curling irons and your flat irons is very limited. So it's really important. It really serves you well to bring an extension uh, 
power cord, power surge protector thing. So you can plug five different, you know, tools into your spot. Otherwise, there's just simply not enough outlets for you to work properly. And that's that's definitely something that you learn from being in the business and showing up and there's no power for you. Oh, wow. So let's talk about the 16 to 18 hour days. I want to go back there. It's a long day. Um, you're probably exhausted. You're tired. But hopefully in the end, it's all worth it um, once you get that paycheck. So how how does one get paid in television and film? You know, some stylists who work in a salon are used to getting cash on, on hand every day or tips or, you know, a paycheck once a week or every other week. How does it work when you're working in television and film? Sure. It's a good question. Um, well, as I mentioned, generally television and film is a union based production, meaning you need to be in the union in order to, um, work on the job. So when you go in to work on this production, they'll give you a stack of, it's called start work. It's basically, it's paperwork for you starting the job and it's quite a stack and sometimes it can be a little overwhelming. So you fill all of, fill all of that out. And you are, you are paid by the hour, but weekly. You get a paycheck every week. So let's say you worked two days in that week for this particular production. Um, there is a specific way that you track your hours, you track your lunch breaks, um, and then at the end, you turn in all your paperwork for the day, and then accounting adds up your hours, and um, or the department head will add up the hours, and then accounting cuts you a check and you get paid weekly. Payday is usually Thursday in production work. Oh, I'm sure a lot of people would love that. Yeah. On average, how much can a hair and makeup artist make working in television and film? Well, it varies. It depends on the type of production it is. Um, there are multiple layers of production types within the industry. There's tier one, tier twos, tier threes, there's majors contract, and the majors contract is the one that everybody re really wants. That's the one you get paid the most on, um, and that's like all the major movies, all the major TV shows, they're on a majors contract. So it can, and, and honestly, it's set by each production. So as a hairstylist on a tier one, which is like the lowest, I mean, you might be making... <laughs> 10, 15, 19 dollars an hour. I, I don't really, I can't really tell you exactly how much it is because it's up to the discretion of each production on the tiers. However, on the majors contract, uh, a day player, and again, it's up to the, the, the contract or each production to set the rates. But generally, it's about, uh, 35 to 42 dollars an hour. Um, and that's just straight time and that doesn't include overtime and, um, the overtime hours, when you go into penalty, if they don't break you at a certain amount of time, then you start accruing penalty penalties like lunch penalties or dinner penalties. And that can really lead up to a marginally increased paycheck. And that's definitely an advantage of being a member of the union. They, they provide that non-union projects really don't have that. So, um, so, you know, it depends on how many days you work. It depends on many, how many hours are in your shift. So it's all variable, but there's one other way that you get paid and that is known as a kit rental. So the fact that you're schlepping all of your equipment to the job and you're basically allowing that production to have access to your kit you are paid a fee for that, and that is called kit rental fee or box rental. And that can range anywhere from 25 to 50 extra dollars a day. So it really depends on the project that you're working on, the budget, and if you're union or non-union, uh, the amount that you'll actually get paid. Absolutely, yes. So, yeah. So you could start as, you know, as low as what, $15 and go up to as much as 40 Oh, well, you can go higher if you become a personal on a major's contract. I mean, you can be making $60 an hour straight time, 
And then when you go into penalty, it's time and a half. So then your rate goes up to $120 an hour. Then if you go into double time penalty, your rate is, you know, $240 an hour. So, I mean, it's... I'm sure this is sounding so intriguing for a lot of our listeners. They're probably like, uh, hello, I want to be a personal. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it takes years. Everybody wants to be a personal. That's what everybody aspires to. But it takes years and years and years of apprenticeship and working your way up from the bottom and day playing and showing up and working in the most inclement conditions and just awful environments, you know, like it's four in the morning and it's you're in the middle of a snowstorm and you're in the middle of nowhere in a snowstorm and you just have to do it yes. and then you meet people and then you hone your skills and then you know if you really dedicate it and you really want it you'll continue to you know find the right avenues for your for your talent and to make it up, hopefully, towards, you know, being somebody's personal. So, and Michelle, can you explain to our audience what it means or what is a personal? A personal is a an artist, a hairstylist that is working exclusively with one performer, one actor. And you, you take care of that actor exclusively. So while that actor is on set, you are their one and only hair person. Nobody else touches their hair. Um, nobody else, you know, you're part of the team. You are their team. So you have the actor, you have a makeup person that's a personal, you have a hair person that's a personal, and generally you have a wardrobe person. And that's a dedicated team that works exclusively with that actor. So now if there are some hairstylists and makeup artists who are listening who want to work in television and film, would you recommend that they relocate? Let's say they're in a small town. Uh, is it necessary for them to live in a place not like New York, LA, or Atlanta, Miami? Uh, I would say yes, because, you know, there are productions that do go into smaller towns looking for additional hairstylists. However, the talent generally, the talent pool in those remote, more remote areas are um, basically salon based. So it's different skill set. There's nothing wrong with being salon based, but I'm just speaking specifically in terms of hiring production um, hairstylists. So Generally, you're not going to have, you're not going to get work in those environments. So my suggestion is to move to a more metropolitan area that actually has a uh, production work, like New Orleans. New Orleans has, is a booming soundstage area. That's like, they're calling it the, um, I believe they're calling it the Los Angeles of the East because there's so many new sound stages being built. Atlanta, hot Atlanta, <laughs> major, major production um, center. I know there's some production in North Carolina, New York, um, L.A. So if you really, really want to get into production work, you have to go to where the production work is and um, start, your, start, start your way up the ladder. Right. Yeah, you have to. And Michelle, you have over 25 years of experience in, you know, working in television and film. And then at some point you, you start to look to transition, you know, to, you know, take your skills from working on set to being able to provide, uh, your oh so highly sought after specialty to the private sector, to, uh, to consumers and to clients. Tell us a little bit about that process for you. Well, I had been in the industry, the television film industry for many years. And over the years, I have garnered great specialty skills that aren't generally or readily available to the private sector. And I knew for a long time that I wanted to eventually take my skill set and give back um, because I, I've had great success in my professional career. And I just wanted to be able to take my specialty skill set like, for example, working with wigs um, and help people that really needed the work, that, that could really benefit from that specialty work. Um, and so I began um, making my services available to a private clientele. It was all word of mouth. And, you know, 
reaching out to the cancer centers and letting them know of my background and that I was available to help cancer patients get wigs that looked so incredibly real um, and, uh, you know, do it, do it in a very... Um, like wig masterly way. <laughs> <laughs> so now, did you did you decide to open a salon to be able to do this? I did. In fact, it's been about nine years in coming, the salon. But before I actually opened the salon, which I did in this year of June, I rented a, a booth, a booth rental for two years as I was still doing production work in the city. And at the same time, it allowed me to start developing my clientele without having to take on the overhead of rent, electricity, you know, all the overhead of what salon ownership means. Right. And it has it, it was a fantastic way to get introduced to hair styling, hairdressing and specialty work in the private sector. So you have a specialty in wigs, paramedical esthetician is that per- correct <laughs> that that is correct a paramedical esthetician and and cancer image consulting so could you tell our audience a little bit about what that entails well I had mentioned earlier in the um, interview that I um, wanted a long time ago I wanted to uh, work with cancer patients and I started as a makeup artist so in 2004 I took my first class for cancer image consulting, which includes makeup, um, how to teach cancer patients how to do their makeup, uh, product selection, because not every makeup brand is ideal for cancer patients with, you know, compromised immune systems and special skin needs. Mm -hmm. Um, And then uh, I, I didn't feel that I could emotionally handle all of that at that time. So I continued to hone my craft, and um, two years ago, again, when I realized I wanted to work with the private sector and help, you know, people with hair loss and cancer, et cetera, et cetera, I decided to incorporate the wigs into the work, and then all of a sudden, I just realized that it was no longer an issue, me being concerned about not being able to emotionally handle the the emotional needs of women going through cancer and just was a non-issue and I'm honored and overjoyed to be able to provide a healing and beautiful service for these women. I think that's such special work that you do. I also have a a special place in my heart for uh, helping women, children, individuals who have experienced hair loss of any kind, whether it's from a terminal illness or, you know, just someone experiencing alopecia from stress related or medical causes. Um, it's just, it's such a blessing to be able to give back in such a way that enhance, enhances a person's uh, image as well as their quality of life. Oh, absolutely. You know, hair loss is hair loss. It, do, it doesn't really matter the cause of the hair loss, you know, whether it's medical or non-medical. Um, it's, you know, hair is such a powerful thing and how we are viewed in society and how we view ourselves with hair that um, the, the power of putting hair back on somebody, you know, woman, man, child, it doesn't matter. Uh, the power of putting hair back on them is so psychologically transformational and healing for these individuals that um, it, it, it's just so overwhelming. And, um, and I've seen people cry with me because they didn't have hair and then you know five ten minutes later when we put the wig on they're laughing with joy they're crying with joy I mean it's just that powerful it really is and and you know hair is one of those things that is so connected to our identity who we are as a person and and when you lose that you feel like you've lost your identity you've lost a piece of yourself you know uh i for one very early on you know around six years of age uh had a horrible chemical um service done that literally took out all of my hair so i realized at a very early age how impactful and psychological you know hair can be uh, but it's just so rewarding to be able to be in a position to to give back and to help 
uh, put a smile on someone's face, you know, to bring them to tears in a very special way because they're happy. They're excited about um, their life, about, you know, just going out in society and being viewed as a whole person. Because, you know, sometimes when you see a person with hair loss, people make assumptions automatically and go, oh, my God, what's wrong with them? Are they sick? Or, you know, it's just it's just very awkward. But it's so just fulfilling to be able to offer that as a service. So I can definitely relate to you on that. Um, I, I want to talk about wigs. Um, you have been on the scene for quite some time and you were doing lace fronts before sh- the, the average consumer knew what a lace front wig wa- was. I remember, you know, looking at, I, I think it was Beyonce on a cover, uh, of a, a popular magazine and Everybody was talking about her hairline, like, oh, my God, her hair looks beautiful. It's amazing, but it looks different. Something going on with her hairline, and no one could figure it out. And then finally, people discovered lace front wigs, and they have gone mainstream. Everybody is now aware or wearing uh, a lace front. So let's talk about wigs. Let's talk about that. That's that's kind of what, you know, you have a specialty in hair pieces. Uh, tell us about how you started in that. And, you know, you learned a lot about construction and design. So uh, how did you get your start doing that? I got my start in wig, uh, wigdom, uh, if you will, <laughs> uh, working um in a theatric, working on a theatrical production. Um, at the time uh, when I first realized I had a passion for wigs, I was working at Chicago Lyric Opera. I was painting faces for the opera world. And I, it was my first real introduction to wigs, see them up close, see their construction. And I was, I didn't know how I was going to end up working with wigs, but I knew one day wigs were going to be a part of my world. <laughs> yes. And so, um, although I never did wigs at that time, that was my introduction. And then, uh, fast forward several years to the time when I worked with American Ballet Theater. I was the director of wigs and makeup for American Ballet Theater for five years. And that's when I really got to start working with wigs and construction and, um, designing, you know, the looks of the wigs. And that was the beginning of my my love affair with wigs, and that still continues today. And I've had various m- mentors, wig mentors, the main one being Bob Kelly, um, who has since passed, but he was a makeup and wig legend. You could Google Bob Kelly and f- find out what a, an amazing um, artist and groundbreaking artist he was at the time. And he had a wig shop in Manhattan and I would go there and work on dressing wigs for various plays, various shows that his shop was building. And, you know, in the meantime, he would teach me how to custom build foundations, lace fronts and and ventilate hair and all kinds of things. Oh, I am so fascinated by the wig world, wigdom, if you will. (laughs) (laughs) I love it from construction to a complete product. It's just so amazing how uh, miraculous for me (laughs) that I'm sure some people are like, okay, Brenda, you're being extra, but how miraculous that process is because I know what that piece of hair can do for someone. So, you know, you're talking about starting with nothing, you know, just a piece of material, right? You absolutely, and there are different types of material materials that go into wig making. Um, obviously, there are so many different types of wigs, so many different construction methods, so many different fibers that can be used, even different types of laces. You know, touching back on you're talking about lace front wigs. When a wig is being built, you know, there's the wig maker has a whole selection of different types of laces that they can put in different parts of the wig. Generally, you want um, a nice Swiss lace or a film lace on the front of the wig. Um, opera lace um, is very hardy and kind of stiff, and it's something that you would probably definitely put on like uh, a wig that receives a lot, a lot of wear, like a wig being worn in the opera, a wig being worn on Broadway, um, but but the front, the front lace is always, you know, a fine lace that just blends into the skin tone, um, so you can't really see it. But there's all different kinds of um, materials uh, in wig making. It's not just one thing. And that's another show, right? 
That is another show. Yes, absolutely. Oh, wigs are amazing. They amazing. are amazing. I love them. I, I love hair, period. But I love hair extensions. I love wigs. I love the transformation that they make. But can you give an our audience an idea of how long it takes to make one wig? If you're ventilating it yourself from start to finish, from uh, you know choosing the uh, material you're going to use and constructing that and actually ventilating it and, and to the finished product, how long does that actually take? Once the foundation is made, it takes a minimum, and this is if you're very adept and quick at ventilating, it takes a minimum of 40 hours to fully ventilate um, a custom wig. And, and usually, it, you know, it's with human hair. Generally, it is. It can be, you know, with synthetic, but um, generally, it's, it's human hair. So a minimum of 40 hours per wig. Wow. And we're talking one person working on each wig? That is correct. One person uh, with one wig on a head form, on a block, um, working 40 hours. Wow. To get all the hairs ventilated and knotted correctly and the direction is, you know, putting it in the right direction and everything. 40 hours is a lot. It's a it lot. is a lot. Oh, my God. And so it takes a very special person to be able to do uh, wig construction and wig ventilating and designing wigs. But you are a master at designing wigs and customizing wigs for your clients. Um, now, so you have a salon. What's the name of your salon? My salon is named Anne Michelle Hair. And you are an alternative hair specialist. Can you explain to our audience what that means? Sure. An alternative hair specialist, rather than calling myself a wig specialist, which kind of limits it to, in most people's mind, to just a wig, an alternative hair specialist can, you know, include top pieces, custom built pieces for perhaps people that may have scars on their head. I have the ability to customize those pieces, hair extensions, wigs, partials, switches. So there's a whole variety of alternative hair options rather than just wigs um, to specialize in. So that's why I call myself an alternative hair specialist. So if there's someone listening in and either they themselves or a family member or friend has uh, hair loss issues, you know, there's so many, there's such a vast variety of, of alopecia out there, which is simply just hair loss or, you know, a person who's, um, like you were saying, going through chemo or someone who has trichotillomania and they're looking for someone who can customize a hair piece or wig for them. Um, you know, what, what can you provide for someone who, who comes to you? Let's just say they're in your area and, and they want to, uh, have you create a piece for them. You know, what's that process like? Do they have to go through, through a consultation? Well, of course, they'll, they'll come to see me and we'll start with a consultation, which generally takes up to about an hour. And I sit with them and discuss, obviously discuss, you know, the cause of the hair loss, um, how long they would need, they would want to be wearing the alternative hair piece. Um, you know, everything about them and how they live their life. Um, because the type of hair piece that you choose is really important that it blends well with their lifestyle and their perhaps styling abilities. Um, so it would start with the interview or the, the consultation, which is kind of like an interview. Right. Actually. Right. <laughs> And then um, I move on to, you know, depending on the type of hair loss, like you said, is it trichotillomania? Is it alopecia areata? Is it al alopecia universalis totalis? Whatever it may be. Um, and I deal with each, each condition individually and specifically. So there, it, it's, it's all completely, completely customized. Even if, the solution to this particular individual's um, hair loss would be one of my ready-made synthetic designer wigs. I still go in and customize each wig for the client's shape of face, uh, for the length, for fine-tuning, for um, the ultimate high-end, perfect, undetectable fit. And I think that's the secret, Anne Michelle. I think when it comes to wigs, 
hair extensions, alternative hair pieces, that it has to be customized for that particular in- individual to look natural and realistic. Oh, absolutely. Especially, especially if you're working with ready-made synthetic wigs. And for most cancer patients, um, I have found that that is perhaps the best solution because well, with my Anne Michelle hair wigs, they look so, um, the, the, fi- the synthetic fibers look so unbelievably natural. The color choices that I've, you know, put together are so natural. There's a lot of rooted options. Um, there's a lot of ombre options for, you know, a more progressive look. But still, no matter how good it looks just plopped on their head, they always have to be customized to give it that undetectable look. And with the, my background of working on television and film, you know, because TV has changed to HD, and HD is all textural issues, the biggest giveaway on a wig is not customizing it, not doing those little extra things, those expert things that make it believable, that sells it as not a wig, like as their hair. Oh my God. And it's so important. I, I find myself often watching television and actually just the other night I was, I'm not going to name the show, but I was watching, um, someone do an interview and the person interviewing, I just wanted to grab the wig, take it off, texturize it, <laughs> thin it out and put it back on. I was like, Oh my God, someone please. But it just, it's, it makes such a huge difference. So those of you who are listening in and you're exploring the world of wigs, maybe you wear wigs, always, if you're a hairstylist, make sure you're texturizing, you're fine tuning that piece for your clients. And if you're not a hairstylist, you're not outside um, and you're just kind of shopping around your consumer, take it to someone who specializes in that so that they can customize a look that fits you perfectly. And the, another thing you mentioned was something for their lifestyle. Finding a piece that works not just for that person's hair, you know, just for their look, but for their lifestyle. Oh, exactly. I mean, if, you know, if they're set up with a wig that they don't have the skills or the ability or the energy level to take care of it properly, it's, they're defeated from the the beginning and they're, they're not going to wear it or take care of it or, you know, it just becomes overwhelming. And so you've defeated the whole purpose. So it's really important to take into account, as I do on my, you know, my private consultations is, uh, you know, how, how do you live your life? What kind of skills do you have? What would you, are you a no maintenance type of person? But then again, I come back to very special clientele, the cancer patients. And as they go through chemo, they don't feel well. So they really need, um, you know, very uh, kind of wash and wear hair, hair that kind of takes care of itself, really. Mm-hmm. Um, so I usually set them up with one of my Anne Michelle hair designer ready to wear uh, wigs from my line, which I've hand selected. Now, another thing that uh, a client will have when they come and visit me for their alternative hair needs, especially for a wig fitting, is that because I know how to make wigs, I take measurements of the head to, uh, and they're very, they're about seven very standard wig making measurements that I take just to ensure a proper fit. Because from, you know, if you put a wig on somebody's head, it may look like it will fit from front to back, but from top of ear to top of ear, or from, you know, just the nape, it's too big. So it's an ill fitting wig. Again, that's another giveaway. The wig doesn't fit properly. It starts to slide. It doesn't fit properly, so it looks wiggy. I mean, these are all the super custom things that I provide when, you know, a client comes to see me in a very private, very nice environment. And I think that privacy, it's so important because it's already such a a personal, touchy uh, sensitive subject, if you will, when you're speaking of hair loss. So, uh, it's really awesome that you have a place, uh, that's comfortable and private where someone can come and, and talk to you about their hair loss issues and you provide a customized solution for each and every client. And you don't just provide, you know, alternative hair services. You do other things, right? Uh, I do. I have a quite a bevy of uh, special skills that I have. Yeah. 
So we're talking, you know, hair color and cutting and, um, you know, the whole plethora of, of designing and customizing hair. Absolutely. Whether it's a wig um, or on a human head. <laughs> <laughs> so before we go, Ed, Michelle, can you tell us your top three tips, tools, or tactics for becoming a successful beautypreneur? <laughs> My top three. Number one, if you are passionate about this field, never give up. Never give up. It's okay to feel afraid. It's okay to, you know, be unsure about your skills, but show up, step up to the challenge and never give up if you really want to do it. I think I'm speaking in terms of trying to break into the production world and, and that type of thing because there, there are walls there, but if you really want it, you're going to make it happen. It's going to happen for you. Number two, education, education, education. I think you never stop learning. I think you should never stop learning, no matter where you are in your field of your profession, no, how, no matter how far you are down the road of being an expert. There's always, always room to learn more. And number three, um, I don't know if I have number three. I think education, education, education was four, five, and six. Four, five, and six. <laughs> <laughs> and more education. Never stop learning, right? Never stop learning. And believe in yourself. And um, and make sure you always take the high road and act in a professional manner. Always. Always take the high road. Even if for some reason in the production world somebody's yelling at you, which happens. Always take the high road. Great, great, great advice. Thank you again so much for everything you've offered us here. You've been so knowledgeable, so gracious with your uh, all the information that you've gathered over the years, all the experience. You've been so insightful and so authentic. Thank you. We appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much. I'm. It's my honor and my pleasure to share this information with your listeners and um, hopefully um, it's it's helped somebody. <laughs> I think you have helped us all immensely and thank you guys. We appreciate you tuning in every week. We could not do it without you. We're so happy that you decide to join us. Uh, you know, I'm always astounded at how many people from all over the world are listening in to the Hair Artist Academy podcast. And I am so grateful for all of you. And until next time, live your purpose, pursue your passion, and be the prosperous being you were born to be. Thanks for listening to the Hair Artist Academy podcast. For the show notes and links discussed in today's episode, visit HairArtistAcademy.com.